I am going to talk about uh, a way of looking at the physics of the standard model effective field theory that has this sort of geometric attached to it. Uh, I want to kind of assure you at the start that it's, it's not just a matter of uh, theorists adding to their acronyms. There is actually a really a very basic reason why this is a, a good way to think about things. It makes things very simple. And I think for your purposes, um, it's, it's going to make it so that theorists can provide codes to you and more precise theoretical predictions to interpret the data going forward is, the, is really the key point. So I want to get to that pretty quickly, uh, but I also wanted to make sure to recognize my collaborators. They're on this first page here from the, uh, from the last year. Their names are color coded. And then if I uh, go to the papers, I can go on. Their names are color coded here as well. So I'm, uh, two of these papers were indicated as maybe you could take a look at beforehand. Um, and I realized they're theory papers, so they might be not totally easy to understand from an experimentalist uh, point of view, but I, I really want to emphasize this is really quite simple. I'm going to try and explain it in the simplest way possible and focus on two papers this year, the one in January and, and the one in uh, July. Um, but there is a couple of other works here. And I also want to emphasize that um, you probably have noticed that multiple theorists and multiple theory groups, people from multiple theory groups, have been talking more and more in EFT talks about things like scalar geometry and geometric stuff. So multiple groups are kind of coming to the realization that this way of thinking is, is very useful in terms of basically understanding the physics that's present. So it's usually a good sign when multiple groups are kind of converging on the same point of view and the same way of thinking about things, even if it sounds a bit strange, like why are you talking about geometry? So let me get to that point uh, very straightforwardly why we're talking about geometry here. So we're talking about geometry because of a very simple fact um, and how that fact projects into the effective field theory interpretation of your data going forward. And so, so the fact is, is that the Higgs field is a bit special uh, and the Higgs field is special in one particular way in that it's a field that becomes a number. So it's a, it has a vacuum expectation value. And when it has a vacuum expectation value, there are some important consequences in terms of interpreting your experimental measurements. So let me just remind you about this in the standard model in a very introductory way, just because we're gonna build into the EFT and see how that sort of very basic fact the fact that we have a field that's becoming a number is, is affecting uh, the effective field theory interpretation and leads to this idea of the geom geometric approach being very useful and powerful and, and helpful, I think, for the future. So in the standard model, what is the consequence of the Higgs field becoming a number? So at the top of this slide, I'm just showing you the, the standard model Lagrangian to fix my notation. The Higgs field here is the EH, it's a scalar doublet field, and we're only looking at interactions up to dimension four, okay? Now, when people talk about the Higgs taking on a vacuum expectation value, sometimes they say there's a background uh, field value. Sometimes they say there's a Higgs condensate. For our purposes, it's gonna be green blobs. So I was inspired by some presentation of Hitoshi a couple of weeks ago, which showed it in this way, which is visually representing the Higgs field vacuum expectation value. So I can't read the Japanese, but nevertheless, green blobs in this talk is gonna be vacuum expectation value, okay? So what's being shown here is, the, is a nice way of thinking about it. So there's a condensate in space, and then depending upon uh, how the uh, remaining standard model fields couple to the Higgs field, uh, they bump into the background field value, the condensate. And proportional to their coupling strength, it makes, you know, it makes it so they move slower through space. You could think of that intuitionally. And that's basically them getting mass. And uh, not only that, when they get mass, uh, certain combinations of fields, which are useful to think about before the Higgs takes on its vacuum expectation value, uh, it, certain combinations become useful to think about after the Higgs takes on its vacuum expectation value, right? So you start off with W and B fields in the standard model, and then it's useful to think about Zs and, and, and Ws, the other Ws. Uh, and not only that, you also get combinations of parameters which are in the Lagrangian initially that become useful to think about, and many of them are multiplying the VEF, the masses, okay? So this is just in the standard model what happens, and you know this, I'm just reminding you of this, it's the consequence of the Higgs field uh, being able to take a vacuum expectation value become a number. And what the geometrics math is about is that, that that has important consequences when you start to interpret the data in effective field theories. So, and that's actually what's caused a lot of confusion in the past as well. So let me just first push a little further and reminding you how it works in the standard model with some simple examples, which we'll build upon. So just think about the kinetic term for the Higgs, okay? So if you expand this guy out, then you have uh, some cases where you get two scalar fields and two vector fields. And they interact at a point, four fields interacting at a point, it's a four point function. But if we take it to a vacuum expectation value, which again are green blobs in this talk, then that four point function 
descends to a two-point function. And you have to do a rotation to go to the mass eigenstate interaction. So you get certain combinations of parameters initially uh, become useful to think about once you're expanded around the VEV. But it goes through a simple rotation, and then the, B, the, the W and B fields in the weak eigenstates become the mass eigenstate fields. And you have masses for two of those fields, the W and Z, and, and the photon remains massless. The rotation is uh, just given here. And this UBC, I'm just going to build on this in a moment. But this is just as it is in the standard model. So this is totally trivial, right? You know this. And you also know that this happens for the, for the Yukawa, right? You start off with a three-point function. And then it descends to a two-point function with a mass for the fermions. So just to remember the words that when you have the vacuum expectation value around, you have higher endpoint functions descending to lower endpoint functions. And you get combinations of, of parameters and you get things multiplying the VEV, which are useful to interface with the experiment. I mean, masses are useful things because they appear in lots of different experimental measurements in terms of interpreting the data. So that's how it is in the standard model. And it's just a limited case of this happening in the standard model simply because you're starting with a renormalizable theory. So there's not many high endpoints around, okay? But the Higgs field still becomes a number in the EFT. And, and when people were doing EFTs in the past, they usually weren't thinking about Higgs fields, which is why people, you know, it took a while for us to come to this realization as theorists for quite a few years, we were confused. But that, that still happens. The Higgs field's becoming a number. These, pre, you know, the vacuum expectation value is around. And so what's been happening in the standard model can also happen in the standard model EFT, where we're taking the standard model Lagrangian and we're adding all possible higher dimensional operators. The important difference is, is that because we're adding an infinite tower of, of higher dimensional operators, there's a lot more Higgs fields. So you can have a lot more endpoint functions descending down to like two point functions and, and three point functions uh, from something that initially was a very high dimension operator. So let's just focus on the case of Higgs to gamma gamma. Okay, so when we start to go uh, greater than d uh, equals four, and you want to think about, say, this three point function, in the standard model, that's only happening through a loop. But in the EFT, you can have a dimension six operator, and then one of those Higgs fields in the dimension six operator can be taken to a vacuum expectation value, and you get that three point function. So it perturbs your measurement. And it also is the case that you can not only have that at dimension six, but you can have that at dimension eight, where you have just more Higgs fields. And if they become VEVs, you still get a contribution to the three point function. And it also happens at dimension 10 and dimension 12 and so on and so forth. It just happens for the whole infinite tower. And you can also, when you're uh, having that happen, you can have symmetry generators inserted contracting with the Higgs field indices. So those two things can happen. And really, this is uh, the idea that essentially this interaction, when you have the EFT around and the Higgs field becomes a number, this interaction is happening in a medium, the Higgs medium. So we know how in field theory, we can describe things like that. The way you describe that is with the geometry. There's a background field value that this interaction is happening on. And that's why the geometric method is useful. It's because it's there. There is a vacuum expectation value and there is a Higgs medium this interaction is happening in. And so if you think that way and just write down things with indices, you simplify the physics and you avoid some confusions. And that's what the geometric method is about. So just like in the standard model, we're going to have things uh, like masses be generated. We're going to have combinations of couplings that are useful to interface with experiment. We're going to have combinations of the fields that were initially there are useful to interface with experiment. All that's going to happen just like in the standard model following the VEV. Okay? And it's just that it happens a lot more because we have this whole infinite tower of higher dimensional operators that does this. And it just is very efficiently expressed as a geometry dressing the three-point function. Right? So, right? so if you want to have all of this stuff added up, you just dress this with a geometry, okay? And that's, that's the key point that we've understood as theorists in the last couple of years. So that's just with pictures, and this is it with math, okay? So uh, as usually is the case, there was a Russian 20 years ago saying something like this, and you have to give them credit. So here's the Russian that 20 years ago, or actually much more than 20 years ago, was saying something similar to this, but it was in general terms. Uh, of, of basically the idea of having things like this in your field theory, where you have a background field formulation, okay? Now, for our purposes in the standard model EFT, remember we had a derivative on Higgs, derivative on Higgs we were talking about for the standard model case. This phi is just that I've taken the Higgs field and written in terms of four real scalar field coordinates, phi, one, two, three, four. And then this I and J indice runs from one to four. But just like the Russian said, you could do, now we're going to do the thing where we basically have a function in front of the background fields of the scalar field coordinates, which we can take to VEVs. We're just going to write this down as a general object, okay? And that general object is there, and it has to contract these indices. 
it can be there and it can have effects from dimension six operators or dimension eight or dimension 10 operators. But this is a way of just writing down that this interaction is happening on a background, on a medium, okay? And it really is a metric. It's, it's, it's a, something which defines a field space that this interaction is happening on. And in a very real sense from differential geometry, this metric defines curvature uh, when you have higher dimensional operators. So there's a curved field space this interaction is happening on. Now in the standard model case, this thing is also there, but we didn't think about it in the standard model simply because it was a delta function. Okay, so in the standard model, it's just these ones that are on the diagonal here. And because we only write things down up to dimension four, we just had these i and j indices contracted with one another and we didn't write the delta function, but it, it, but it informally could be thought of as being there. And the standard model is now just being perturbed when you have higher dimensional operators when you have an EFT generalization because you have more of these higher endpoint functions descending down to lower endpoint functions. Now, all of this happens proportional to the VEV. We're really looking at things dependent on the Higgs taking out of axiom expectation value. And that's this expectation value of h dagger h here. So this stuff happens proportional to v squared over the cutoff scale. And then there's some unknown Wilson coefficients. But they perturb the standard model case where it's just the just just Kronecker delta or delta ij. And uh, they give these perturbations. Once these perturbations are present, which they can be in general, whenever you have these higher dimensional operators, this is no longer a flat field space. It's no longer just a delta function. It's now a curved field space with this metric defining the structure of the space. Okay, and this is the thing theorists have come to understand in the last couple of years, which is actually very powerful and useful. So we, we've been thinking about this, other groups have been thinking about this as well. Okay, and this is a unique uh, uh, small perturbation on, on the standard model case. So it's actually a unique square root on the matrix, okay? So this is just the case of the standard model kinetic term getting dressed with the background field uh, coordinates, which then can take on a vacuum expectation value. It happens also in the case of the vector field, the Yang-Mills term that you would write down. You can also pull out an object here where A and B run from one to four. It's a function of the scalar field coordinates. And then those can take on vacuum expectation values. And just like before, the ones on the diagonal are a standard model case. There's a delta AB you could have written down, but you didn't really in the standard model. You just wrote it down as the Yang-Mills term with the indices contracted, but it was there formally. And then you can actually have these perturbations, which again lead to a curved field space. So what I showed before in red is uh, one field space. This is in yellow because it's a different field space, okay? So it's different because there's different Wilson coefficients feeding in. So there's different numbers, different things that you want to determine experimentally uh, that can be there. So there's actually one fundamental thing, which is the Higgs taking on a vacuum expectation value. But then because it's coming through operators which have Wilson coefficients and those Wilson coefficients can be different depending on what's happening in the UV, there's multiple geometric spaces that then result. This one in yellow is going to define the couplings and the mixing angles, whereas the one I showed in red is going to define the masses, okay? But there's multiple spaces, and you just can always do this where you dress some interaction with background scalar field coordinate dependence. And it's very powerful to realize that you can do that because it organizes the physics that's associated with the VEV in a very concise and complete way, okay? So going forward, Things in yellow here are individual entries from one of the matrices, uh, one, of the four, the, the, uh, one of the metrics, and the things in red here are coming from the other metric, the one was dressing the scalar two-point function. Now you'll notice what I'm writing down here are things that are useful for interfacing with experimental measurements in terms of low endpoint interactions. So when I say low endpoint, what I'm talking about is like, like propagators and masses and interactions between two fields and another field. So you want to know about the couplings and you want to know about the masses to describe low endpoint physics. And uh, in the standard model, it's the same expressions. It's just that everything that's highlighted in colors here just becomes delta functions, just becomes trivialized in the standard model. But it's then it's the G2 that you're used to for the coupling to the W field. And there's a GZ that you're used to for the coupling to the Z. And then there's electric charge for the coupling to the photon that you're used to. And there's masses that you're used to. But there's one mixing angle, not two in the standard model. But if you look at these expressions and these things in yellow all become just ones, then you see that these are degenerate. It's the same expression and it's the Weinberg angle. Now, it, when you have the EFT, it just is no longer just these simple ones in these yellow uh, highlighted, uh, highlighted and color things. It now can have higher dimensional operator perturbations. Okay, dimension six can perturb this, dimension eight can perturb this. 
But this is the answer for all orders in the Higgs scalar field v squared over lambda squared uh, expansion modifying these geometric uh, Lagrangian parameters. Okay, so these are compact answers which have the standard model limit built in and they have the dimension six stuff which is in SMEFs and built in, but it also lets us go as theorists to dimension eight and dimension 10, and if we want to even go higher in, in, in the expansion of v squared over lambda squared. This expression, these expressions hold for all orders in that expansion parameter. Okay, so they're actually all orders results. And the, the only thing that might confuse you is that there's two mixing angles. Now this one, the one that's this S theta Z appears in the covariant derivative coupling uh, to the fermion fields. Whereas this is the one that appears in the rotation angle from the weak eigenstate fields to the mass eigenstate fields. They're degenerate in the standard model limit. They're just the usual Weinberg angle. At dimension six, they're still the same, but there's actually two of them just for some consistency in the math, which shows up once you go to dimension eight. Okay, so at dimension eight, if you expand this out in terms of the Wilson coefficients times v squared over lambda squared, this uh, one angle is different from the other. And this one appears in the covariant derivative of the, uh, of acting on the fermion fields, okay? So things like that start to happen, which is a bit different in the EFT, but this is still the all orders answer and it lets you go to dimension whatever you want in terms of calculating things. So if you want to use those expressions at all orders as a theorist and as they get into codes for experimentalists, you need to know those geometric structures to all orders uh, in V squared over lambda squared or, or in the scalar field expansion. So it's a remarkable thing that kind of fell into our lap last fall that we can actually write these down. It, was, it shocked us because we didn't expect this. We, all we wanted to do last fall around November was take the, what we had done at dimension six and write things down at dimension eight. Can we get it to work? And, uh, but then when we did that, we realized, oh, we can write it down at any order. Uh, and that's kind of a very powerful thing. Now, why did that happen? It happened because of a very simple fact. So these structures which we're writing down, which are just depending on scalar fields, they can only depend on scalar fields, Wilson coefficients, and then possible symmetry generators you insert between the scalar fields and contract them. So if you want to have that happen, there's only a certain number of ways you can do that. I mean, if you have, uh, if you have uh, symmetry generators, so think about the poly matrices, right? So if you have a poly matrix times another poly matrix, it gives you back a poly matrix times an epsilon tensor. And there's not many ways to contract symmetry generators with scalar field coordinates. And there's really not many ways to, to contract Higgs fields with other Higgs fields. You just get H dagger H essentially. So what's shown here is that you always get essentially a couple of Wilson coefficients at dimension six and dimension eight. And then you just get towers of phi squared or H dagger H on top of what you wrote down at dimension six and dimension eight. And that always happens when you think this way geometrically, and it always happens because of completeness relations. So at the bottom of the slide here, these are just the symmetry generators when you're contracting with scalar fields. And what happens is, is that if you have these guys around, they descend into delta functions. So you can't really write down many ways of contracting symmetry generators in scalar fields. You just end up with delta functions at the end of the day. And that's why you can always write these expressions down to all orders and you can break them down for any endpoint function at all orders. And it's always gonna be really simple and dictated by just a couple of terms, which are there basically up to dimension eight. And so we have these results to all orders. We have the definitions on the previous slide to all orders. So now we can do a lot of calculations that we could never do before. And it's immediately in our hands that we can do these calculations. So that's the last year what we've been doing is, is following this and actually doing these calculations, okay? So well, you can ask later if you want about what these gammas are. All they really are is uh, aspects of symmetry generators, ways of writing down poly matrices in this space. Okay, so with that in hand, and we know how to define now uh, geometrically um, some couplings and masses, we want to go from weak eigenstates to mass eigenstates, okay? So let's just step back for a second and think about the standard model case. Okay, so this caused a lot of confusion in the community and theorists, but it really is very simple. So in the standard model case, I made the point that there was these ones on the diagonal of these two objects that I was talking about, the one in front of the Yang-Mills term and the one in front of the scalar uh, propagator essentially. And I said, it was just ones on the diagonal. So there's just Delta functions, okay? So when you write down the transformation from the weak to the mass eigenstates in the standard model, everyone agrees that this is the transformation. And you just didn't write these guys down because they were just basically one. And why would you bother to write one? They're one because of the simple simplification of a flat field space. You couldn't really write anything else down just because you stuck yourself down to D less than or equal to four interactions. But formally it was a delta function. 
these guys here are the rotations from the weak to the mass eigenstate fields, taking these, these fields in terms of Ws and Bs and turning them into you know, the other Ws, the Z and the A. And this, of course, is something everyone agrees about. And you just get the couplings which are useful to be rotated into these combinations of couplings. And then combinations of these become the GZ bar and that sort of thing. So in the standard model, it's very simple. It's very straightforward. This is what it is. It's just that people didn't bother to think about this term being a delta function, but it was there. And it was trivialized because of the accident of the standard model being just up the dimension four. If you go to the EFT, it's just exactly the same thing, except that you've realized now that there's these field space metrics and they're just there. The square root of these field space metrics are there and they are involved in the transformation from the weak eigenstates to the canonically normalized mass eigenstates. These guys have a leading term in the expansion, which is just a standard model case. It's just that now this, this structure is present in the theory and, and this structure is present in the theory and it's uniquely this transformation from the weak to the mass eigenstates. And any operator basis you choose, this is the answer of how you go from the weak eigenstates to the mass eigenstates. And it's really the answer because it's the only thing you can write down that contracts the indices in a consistent fashion. Okay, so if you want to do something in another operator basis, you slightly change the structure of what's in this GAB or this is HJK, but for any operator basis, this is the transformation from the weak to the mass eigenstates. And it's very straightforward and really dictated by what can you write down contracting the indices correctly. So it's very similar to people getting very confused if you want to think about like say orbits of planets um, and you want to do GR and you want to go like linear order in GR or second order GR and three or third order in perturbing gravity and its interactions. You get very confused, you can choose a coordinate system, you can write things down in a very, very complicated way and it's really a nightmare. But uh, if you realize that it's very simple and if you just follow the indices that that's just GR essentially that you only write down that science field equations, then it's very, very simple. And then you only expand those up order by order. And that's exactly basically the idea here as well. This is the this, this structure that's there at all orders written down because you're contracting the indices. And then we can just expand this at dimension six dimension eight and so on and so forth. And it, the problem is really solved. And in any operative basis, this is the case. Okay, so it's really all you can write down. So it's the unique answer. Okay, so just to reassure you, we're not doing something completely different than what's in codes that you're using to study the data. If you look in SMEFSIM, uh, and if you look at the papers leading to SMEFSIM, this is all consistent uh, with, with what's in that code. Okay, so it's just that we didn't understand this when we initially did this work. So in 2013, when we were initially doing this sort of uh, brute force approach to basically writing down all the interactions, we wrote something down perfectly consistent with what I've told you, just keeping just the dimension six interactions and in the Warsaw basis. And it was having these sorts of rotations. So this thing comes from the yellow metric and it has this term coming from the red guy, but we just kind of brute forced it by hand and expanded out. Modifications happened for the angles. And there was an E bar and a GZ bar and an S bar, all consistent. And it was just brute force. And it's, it's in SMEFSIM now, and you're using it if you're using leading order studies of the data. It's just that we now understand how that, all this stuff comes about in that, as the expansion that first order from that very simple story I was telling you. And now we know how to go to dimension eight and above. So as codes come in the future, which allow you to study things at higher orders, uh, it'll just be the direct extension of this. It's not totally different than what you're already uh, using and what's in your hands. It's just we now understand better what we actually found by essentially brute force when we first met this uh, many years ago. Okay, so good. Now it should be totally obvious at this point, I hope, um, essentially how you uh, can do this for other sort of interactions. What do you do? You always pull out the scalar field coordinates and you isolate them from the rest of the derivative expansion. And then you just turn the scalar field expansion into green blobs. That's the V squared over lambda squared part of the expansion. So it's still the standard model EFT. You still have all these operators you can write down, but you just basically separate out the scalar fields from the derivative expansion. And then you have the two expansions separated out nicely. And this part is what I've been talking about, understanding this part, which basically dictates the low endpoint interactions that feed into your measurements, which will get very precise. Now there is a term that you have to worry about a little bit that we've worried about, which is derivatives acting on scalar fields. This scalar field can become a VEV and you can also expand this out and get like a vector field. And, and this term gets grouped with the derivative expansion as you saw for the propagator of the uh, scalar field. But that's it. I mean, you just do this organization of things going forward and that's what the geometric math is. It's just the standard model EFT understood in this kind of nice way that you realize there's a background field and this is a nice way to organize the physics. So you can just, 
solve problems instantly that otherwise people couldn't solve for, you know, ever. So let me show you how it lets us just do calculations we couldn't do before, because it's really quite simple. Okay, so just as a mathematical technical point, you can formally constructively uh, derive this uh, metric, these metric structures from the Lagrangian. They're constructible. If you want to talk about that later, we can talk about that. But uh, more importantly, for your purposes, there's only a couple of these things which are relevant for many of the experimental measurements that you're going to be doing, already studying in EFT interpretations and will be studying in the near future. It's just in the case of the CP even stuff up to four point interactions, what's on the bottom of this slide. So these ones I talked about a lot. There's another one which is pretty trivial, right? It's just the scalar potential itself. That's just a function of the scalar field coordinates. But then there's some things like this where you have W fields and you can dress them with scalar fields and have symmetry generators inserted. You can have derivatives acting on scalar fields and then you can have these indices work out so that you have an interaction with the field strength and you get another geometric object in front of that function of the scalar field coordinates and symmetry generators. You have generalizations of the Yukawas and dipole operators. And you of course have the same story with the gluon fields but there it's even simpler because the Higgs doesn't carry color charge. So it just doesn't become very complicated. Okay, it's just really just delta functions here. So it's, uh, it's really a small number of, of structures that you have to be able to write down and understand in this expansion at all orders. It's always simple to write this thing down at all orders. And it's very powerful once you have that in hand. And so now that's basically what we have as of January, we've basically got these things written down, okay? So this was a non-trivial fact, but now it's simple, okay? And I, I should emphasize there is a choice here. Okay, so there is a choice here uh, in terms of how we're writing things down. Now it's always, the physics I've been talking about is always present in the theory, right? There's, there is a Higgs vacuum expectation value. It's always there, any operating basis it's there. But how we choose to organize it and how the individual terms appear in, in what are these metrics and these connections between uh, different fields, uh, that there's some choice there. And that choice that we're making is consistent with the Warsaw basis and what's in this MEFSIM, which is just remove derivative operators as you can in terms of operators with less derivatives, okay? And use the equation of motion to simplify things. And this is the standard choice in EFT. So this is a choice that led to the Warsaw basis and was how we were normalizing the theory in 2013. It's what's in SMEFSIM. And it's really just completely industry standard to make that choice. But there is a choice here uh, in terms of exploiting the physics that's always there. And, and this is the choice that we're making. Okay, so that's, there is some choice. Okay. So if you make this choice, your life becomes much easier. So let's just talk about that. Okay, so uh, there's an instant payoff, which is basically shown here. So the growth in the operator forms and connections, I tried to emphasize before, essentially you write down a couple things up to dimension eight, and then it's just H dagger H after that on top of what you wrote down up to dimension eight. You can really see this here, hopefully in this slide. Let's just look at this for a second, okay? In the case of the, of the HIJ that we talked about, at dimension six, there's two operators. Dimension eight, there's still only two. Okay, so it's H, H dagger H times what you already had. Dimension 10 is only two, H dagger H times what you had again. And that's one that's very simple and saturates essentially right away. Dimension six, you have something that's not there at dimension four, but, but that doesn't get more complex other than H dagger H towers on top of that. The other one we talked about, this guy uh, a lot, which dictates the couplings, the GAB, there's only three in the Warsaw basis when you write down to dimension six. So when you go to dimension eight, there's one more that you write down. And in the back of slides, you can see the explicit definitions of things. But then after that, it's just H dagger H on top of that. But that dictates the masses and couplings at all orders. And the first one, uh, the, the first one dictates the masses and then the second line dictates the couplings and mixing in those as I was showing you. The third guy is a bit interesting, okay? So as I said, there's some choice. And in the Warsaw basis, you choose to essentially remove derivatives if you can. And that's why at dimension six, this guy doesn't have any entries. So it's just zero by choice. And it's a general structure that's there, but it's a, no, nothing there at dimension six populating it. Dimension eight, you get three terms and at dimension 10, you get one more. And then it just saturates as H dagger H towers on top of that. So you can kind of see this point goes for all of these guys. Okay, so all of this structure that's there, the way that you can think about things has this simplification of how you can write things down at all orders. And we've written it down for all these guys up to four point functions. So that's just a general feature. And you'll notice that once you go to dimension eight, okay, so once things are pushed to dimension eight, at dimension six, okay, you're missing some stuff a little bit, but at dimension eight, once you have it, essentially you basically have all of the complexity that's there. And then on top of that, there's just extra Higgs emissions and B squared over lambda squared corrections to what you've already got written down. 
So the kinematics won't be messed up much once you go from dimension eight to dimension 10, but dimension six to dimension eight, there's a little bit of structure that you can pick up. So why we should go to dimension eight in terms of studying the data and then stop. Um, well, not stop, but I mean, that's gonna be pretty sufficient in terms of learning things. So just translating this into the, what these things do for you. I mean, the first line gives masses, as I was emphasizing. The second line is couplings and mixing angles. The third and fourth line is triple gauge couplings, Higgs couplings to ZZ and WW, the off shell couplings, quartic gauge couplings and Higgs dressings of those things. And then the next lines below are Yukawa interactions and dipole interactions, and then the WZ couplings to fermions and then Higgs also being emitted from that. Okay, so these are color coded here for the next slide. Uh, but this is what these things do. And this is most of what you're studying experimentally already, okay? So going to the next slide, these colors, remember these colors in your mind a bit. Uh, and then these are these lines color coded with what I was just showing you. The important point is to just see that these are flat lines, okay? So what is being shown here? So this is probably something that terrified you if you ever noticed this and Thier is talking about this, okay? So if you, if you look at this, what is this? This is the number of independent parameters getting into the description in the SMEF as a function of the operator mass dimension. So at dimension six, if you just do NF equals one, it's 84 parameters. But if you do the three fermion generations, it gets up to 3,045. That's because you're adding the baryon number violating into the 2,499 parameters you probably have heard the quoted at some other time. But dimension six, this is what's essentially in, in SMAF sim, uh, okay? And at dimension eight, it's terrifying because it goes up to like 45,000 parameters with NF equals three. And this is a log scale, okay? So this is the fact that this is a line, it just tells you that the number of parameters as you go up an operator mass dimension, it's terrifyingly growing, okay? It's exponential. Now, what are the flat lines? The flat lines are how the things I was just talking about, these field space connections, the things that are useful for the things you'll measure experimentally for low endpoint functions, masses, couplings, mixing angles, and then the, the three-point interactions, which you're gonna be extracting from the data over time. And they're flat lines, okay? So if you have a log scale and something's a flat line versus a, a line that's got a, you know, going up, that's very good news. And this means that things just saturate to a constant number. Now, because of the number of Fermi generations, a couple of these are at the you know, 100 level, but that's much better once you're going to dimension eight than 45,000 parameters. Very few parameters actually feed in at dimension eight and above into the sort of corrections of what you're studying at dimension six. We can calculate a lot of them now, and we can actually study these things in, in a detailed way. And you'll notice that these guys saturate basically once you get to dimension eight. There's one case where you need a little more at dimension 10. We can talk about that later if you want. So if you're studying poles of distributions and standard model kinematics dominated stuff, flat lines and theory errors due to higher order terms, basically much better uh, control is now in our hands to study these things. And we can actually look at some cases now and actually see detailed numbers and detailed equations as to what's going on. Whereas tails of distributions, they should be looked at, you should think about them, but it's growing like crazy. It's an exponential growth. And even at dimension eight, you have a lot more parameters. Okay, so this is very good news that within this general, very terrifyingly scary story is a simplification that's sitting there because the Higgs is on a vacuum, taking on a vacuum expectation value. Okay, and this is true in any operator basis that the simplification is around. This is what you wanna study first, okay? So what does this let you do? So let me try and convince you what it helps you with, okay? So what it lets you do, uh, if for example, think about a WZ coupling to fermion pairs. So I've argued that now we understand this things at all orders in V squared over lambda squared. Okay, so what is this? This is a combination of the side agar psi with a derivative, covariant derivative, and what we call this field space connection, one of these ones that was on the bottom of that chart I was showing you before, okay, so this one. So you add these two things together and you can describe this interaction vertex at all orders in B squared over the lambda squared. And it's a very, very simple answer. It's just this, it's this line, okay? So it's a one line answer that has all answers. So this is, a, this is true for the center model. This is true at dimension six, dimension eight, dimension 10, dimension 20. It's all there. A here is just the W's, Z's, and A, so it's all compactified. So it's a very kind of nice thing that it's this simple. If you expand it out in terms of the individual couplings of the W, Z, and photon, you get this. And you just have something which starts to look more like what you're used to in the standard model. Sigma threes and Q's appear for, for the Z, and the photon has just got a Q. And then the W has these ladder operators going up and down. But this is again, an all orders result. Uh, for these interactions, these three-point interactions. So the whole tower of all the green blobs you could dress this with is built into these simple equations because the, this thing's happening on the Higgs medium. 
There should be a simple form of that written geometrically. This is the geometric answer. And this is what you get if you expand it out, uh, if you just write it in terms of the individual components. And it, in here is all the higher order stuff, okay? So that lets us calculate directly and answer questions of what goes on at dimension eight compared to what you think you're learning when you just study the data with dimension six. So we just have the answer now. So you just have to have a decay width. Uh, in the case of the Z, for example, you can write down the decay width from that guy that we wrote down before, or the W, you can write it down as well. Very compact, simple, all orders answer with kind of the obvious generalization of the standard model couplings and masses into the geometric corresponding parameters, which you can write down in simple ways. And then you can just basically just look at the data and see what happens. So here's an answer uh, in terms of how dimension eight uh, modifies interpreting the data with dimension six corrections or keeping dimension eight stuff around. Okay, so before no one could calculate this, but once you have this very simple answer, you just expand it to dimension eight and just study the data or, you know, the chosen uh, constraint on uh, the decay of the Z to lepton pairs, okay? So what's shown in this plot here, there's a couple of lines. So let me explain this a little bit. So what is shown here is what you would get if you just did a dimension six thing, which people could do before last year, like, you know, they do, everyone knew how to do this for a couple of years actually. And that red line is if you just choose some values for some Wilson coefficients and you predict a deviation in Z to LL bar, that would be what you got in a dimension six analysis. Okay, so you just kept a linear dimension six correction to Z to K. If you did the L6 squared thing, you would have this black line. So they're very close to one another. And here they're very close to one another as well. And these are just choosing different values of the Wilson coefficients. So what you should expect on general terms is dimension eight stuff should affect things once you go down and cut off scale, right? Because that's when the dimension eight corrections aren't so small. And indeed that's what happens, but it's really not that bad. Okay, so, I mean, you, you basically have small dimension eight shifts on what you think you were learning at dimension six. And even if you cut dimension six squared, it's not a total nightmare in terms of your interpreting the data, but we can actually quantify this now. We can just study this and we can actually add a theory error in some chosen manner for this extra effect if we don't keep dimension eight stuff around. And uh, this is very good news for the power of electric precision data constraints, studying the data in this math and combining them into Higgs data going forward. So this is good. And this is something that happens for a tree level decay in the standard model, okay? So this is something we can now answer and it's just been answered a couple months ago how this works for the first time. Okay, now we can also do this for Higgs data for things like Higgs to gamma gamma. So that's shown here. So for Higgs to gamma gamma, I told you it's just think about it geometrically. There's a geometric dressing because of this medium, these green blobs that are, that are being suppressed here, but that are modifying things. And so you get a standard model contribution, which is a, you know, through a loop, and then you get the dressing of it due to these geometric factors. Okay, so if you expand this out of dimension six, you get exactly what people write down for Higgs to gamma gamma decay with the dimension six operator corrections and what's in smef -SIM. But this expression is true at all orders again, it's one line again, and you can go to dimension eight directly and you can just see, well, what happens with the dimension eight stuff affecting what you think you learn if you study the data with just dimension six or go to dimension six squared. Okay, so that is just something we can just do now because of this uh, compact all orders uh, answers that we can now derive thinking this way. Okay, so that, that so now, well, here's the answer. So uh, at the standard model uh, case, it's just the leading term. That's remember a loop suppression. Uh, and then the interference of dimension six with the standard model is this term. And then at dimension six squared, if you kept that studying your data, which I know you do sometimes, uh, it's just gonna be this guy squared. But that's not the full answer at one over lambda to the fourth at dimension eight, right? You're missing stuff, which no one could calculate before. But now we can calculate it. It just comes from the Taylor expansion of this to dimension eight, it's very straightforward. And this is the answer. And then you just add in this geometric stuff. You get some extra contributions to what you thought you predicted correctly at dimension six squared. And you get some extra dimension eight stuff around, which basically interferes with the standard model. So this is the piece people couldn't calculate before, but it's pretty straightforward and simple and it just comes out of this expanding, okay? So how does that do in terms of interpreting the data? That's these plots. So you can take those dimension eight contributions and then you can do the same thing we were doing before with Z decay. Okay, so again, there's a red line and a black line. There for some chosen values of the Wilson coefficients leading to a fixed prediction at dimension six, interfering with the standard model, but now for Higgs to gamma gamma. And the black line is when you have the dimension six stuff squared, if you keep that, even though you're not predicting its coefficient correctly. They're, the lines are close to one another. These are for two different values chosen for the Wilson coefficients in the, in the text here. The shaded regions are when we sample the other dimension eight stuff that's there, which 
no one could calculate before, but we can now just calculate very directly. It's on the previous slide. And just, you know, do some coefficient sampling with some chosen distribution for the coefficients of dimension eight stuff coming in. Again, you expect for low lambda, the biggest effects, and that's exactly what happens. But here you can see it's a bigger effect going out to, you know, higher scales in lambda, interpreting this uh, sort of uh, measurement, which is loop suppressed in the standard model, is subject to greater theoretical uncertainties due to neglected dimension eight stuff. It's not the same at dimension uh, eight in terms of the tree level process and loop process. So we have to study this process by process using this technology. And, and basically when we want to combine data for these sorts of measurements of electric precision data, we shouldn't be naive in terms of how we assign theory errors. We need to have informed theory errors because it's quite a different story for the different processes. But now we basically have in our hands the ability to do that because we just know the answer. So we can just choose some distribution of coefficients and then assign a theory error. And it's just our choice how we do that, but, but the answer is known. So it's quite straightforward, okay? So this is good news again, I hope, even though it's subject to a lot of theory uncertainty, but at least we know the answer. You can do similar things uh, for Higgs decaying to four leptons, for example. So here's the expression for Higgs and W decaying to, this is just the off-shell verdicts, the uh, H to ZZ or H to WW. So this is just part of the full answer, okay? And, uh, and, and it's just the off-shell verdicts. But again, it's a three-point function and you have the full all orders answer given here and you see these geometric objects come in again and they define what this thing is. And, and it, this is the answer for any you know, operator order you want. So if you expand this, the standard model piece is just a part of this. And then at dimension six, you get the contributions that people have in SMEFSIM. And, but now we know what the dimension eight and, and so on and so forth. To get the full answer for Higgs to four leptons or Higgs to you know, four fermion decay, you need to add in some other stuff, but that stuff can also be added quite directly using this sort of approach. And so we can build up the answer. We don't have the full thing written down as yet, but that's why there's no, no plots here, but, but it's quite straightforward to execute that. But again, geometrically lets you write down this particular vertex at all orders in the expansion of V squared over lambda squared. And that's a very powerful statement. And you see, again, it's the same sort of objects geometrically appearing in many of these processes, okay? So once we understand these things at all orders, because we can write them down simply, it's great news because we can just do a whole bunch of calculations directly, which people couldn't do before. So that's what we've been doing a lot the last year, okay? So there's other good news here. I'm full of good news. So there's standard model like kinematics in this term. This again is just for the off-shell vertex. So, so the standard model is the leading piece here. So this is the thing that's in the standard model alone. But you'll notice that when you go, you, when you write things down this way, you understand this vertex at all orders in this V over lambda squared expansion, there's only these other guys, these other two other guys in the case of the Z and two other guys in the case of the W, which is the different kinematics populating phase space for this off-shell vertex. So if you take in SMEFSIM and you look at things and you start to do acceptance corrections studying the data, then what you're doing for all the acceptance corrections you're determining is you're basically figuring out the weighted average of this guy and this guy coming in modifying the prediction. But there's really a couple of fundamental different kinematic populations of phase space which essentially what should be done for efficiency purposes is we should figure out acceptance corrections just for this sort of structure. And then we know we can derive the weighted average of how the other, all the other Wilson coefficients come in when we combine it up to the full answer. The point I'm making to you is that there's not arbitrary complicated kinematics, okay? So once you, once you have this answer in your hands and it basically is the story once you go to dimension eight and there's not much on top of that, then you realize that there's really not much in terms of acceptance corrections. It's not an infinitely complicated story. If you did a dimension 10 operator, it's not totally different kinematics than what's there at dimension eight and dimension six. It's limited in terms of different kinematic populations that will be predicted for the Wilson coefficients. And we know that by looking at these sorts of equations and it guides basically how we should determine acceptance corrections efficiently going forward. Okay, so I hope that's somewhat clear as well. We can talk about that more later if you want. Uh, I'm almost done. I might be running out of time actually a little bit. Yeah, I should shut up. So let me just finish and then we can talk more. I've got backed up stuff we can talk about if you want. So uh, this also helps loop corrections. So one thing that would be great is if a theorist could provide loop corrections in loop codes to you that were next in order that were completely, totally kosher and, and you could just use them. And, and uh, the way forward for that to happen for electric corrections as well as QCD and mixed corrections is to use this sort of thinking. So we're, we're on the case here as well. So uh, why does this help? It helps because once you realize that organizing the theory in terms of the background field, uh, once you realize that's a good idea, 
then you can also gauge fix the theory and calculate perturbative corrections, not messing with the background field geometries. So the way you do that is you do something technically called the background field method. So the background field method, what it is, theorists have known about this far before EFT interpretations. What it is, is basically you calculate and you basically don't mess up the background field gauge symmetry. So you can do this in the standard model alone and you don't break SU2 cross U1 when quantizing the theory. In the case of the SMEF, when you have a background field around for the Higgs, it's really good because as a consequence, you then are not messing up the background field geometries that descend from the expectation value of the Higgs field. So you have to use a certain sort of gauge fixing to do that though, and you have to do quantum corrections a certain way, which is not basically industry standard yet, but will become so soon. And you have to have a certain gauge fixing term. So the gauge fixing term was actually how we started off this story. And we first found this before we actually dug ourselves to what I've been talking about for most of this talk. So there was some strange structure in loop corrections years ago that was noticed and it was very confusing. Um, and uh, to figure out what was going on there, we basically had to understand that we wanted to modify gauge fixing from the standard model story, if we wanted to do the background field method into an unusual structure, which is just given here, but it's a unique thing you can write down again. And you'll notice the appearance of these metrics. So this is how you gauge fix without disturbing the background field symmetry and therefore the background field geometry. It's unique. From this, you derive Feynman rules and there are now codes being produced doing this sort of thing. And then when you do loop corrections, you actually understand what you get because otherwise it's a big complicated mess. So just this is the sort of thing that happens. Uh, you basically now are aware of what you should get. You should be able to do cross checks in the codes you developed and then hand to the experimentalist. So if you do this sort of gauge transformation, background field gauge transformation, because you haven't changed the, you've quantized the theory without messing with the background field configuration, the effective action should be invariant under that transformation. This is what's good about using this sort of approach. So that we know should be zero. You can derive from this a bunch of constraints on the predictions that you make for loop corrections. And then you can check your code when you're developing it to make sure it's right to then hand it to you guys to then use. So a lot of constraints then come out of this. One is that the photon has certain structure, which is just like in the standard model. We've checked that and it works at all orders. Another thing that's really nice, which kind of tells you that you're thinking the right way is that you get constraints, for example, Z identity. So in the standard model alone, when you do this background field gauge fixing, you get some nice relationship between two point functions where the Z mass appears. And that's the Z mass in the flat field space. And what happens when you do this in the EFT quantized this way and thinking this way is exactly the, 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 the geometric mass appears in terms of what comes out of the cross checks that you're doing for perturbative code generation. It's just the generalization of the mass concept to the curved background field. It exactly appears in the equations. So that's pretty nice to see. And you also get some corrections here, which have to do with the modification of the two point function of the Higgs field. But from this, nice things appear and then you can just check it. And we've been checking this the last couple of weeks. So let me just give you one example of how this works and stop, because I think I'm going over a bit. Um, you get things like this. You get that you prediction that if you have things designed correctly and you have a code that's correct, then you should have a two point function for the Z, the longitudinal projection of it, related to a mass times the Z chi, the Goldstone uh, two point function. And you can actually have codes that you then generate and you can actually check this. And what appears here is this should be true Wilson coefficient by Wilson coefficient. So a lot of cross checks are introduced in terms of us being able to study our code generation to make sure the code's right. So one of the Wilson coefficients, CHWB, appears in a very complicated way. So this modifies masses, this modifies vertices, it modifies couplings, it's all over the place. But it tells you that this should work. And so you can calculate at one loop all the dependence on that Wilson coefficient coming through all the mass and coupling modifications and all the diagrams. It's a very complicated answer here, which leads to this. And you can take the standard model one loop Z chi, and then you get the geometric mass dependence shift on this parameter. This and this should combine up to exactly cancel this if your code is designed correctly for you guys to then use. And that's exactly what happens in the cross check that we did. Everything works in all the checks we've been doing. And next to leading order code generation, even for electroweak loops using this sort of approach is, is on the way. It's uh, something that's now been enabled with this understanding and it's gonna make it so that you have more powerful tools in your hands than in your future. So I was just gonna stop there, I think, because I think that's, uh, that's almost over time already. So let me stop and just with this summary statement, I kind of hope I convinced you that this, this approach, which sounds very complicated, maybe if you look at the papers, is really very simple. The Higgs is something which is a field which becomes a number. 
So because of that, the vacuum expectation value being there, Higgs physics is physics on a medium, which is the background Higgs field. So it really is physics of curves field space is what we're studying. So when we're looking for deviations from the standard model, we're actually looking at kind of something really cool in field theory, which is all sorts of geometries, which are appearing and modifying your experimental measurements. Uh, but thinking this way is incredibly powerful because it enables us to do calculations that you can't do otherwise. So that's basically what I have to say. Maybe I should just stop completely there.